Brooklyn. I don't know what Thank you, Michelle, for making me come here today. <laughs> um, I was asked to speak about eliminating hepatitis C by 2030 for science and the reality. I can't even remember why we chose this topic or um, also whether I was meant to stay on topic. And I can't remember what you told me, Michelle, so I'm just going to present. I invariably interrupt myself and others in my trains of thought, but essentially the focus of the whole talk is going to be on hepatitis C elimination by 2030. But most of you are never going to do hepatitis C, so that's a little dull on a certain level and a pretty amazing thing on another level because of what we can achieve. Um, so if you've got questions, I'm quite happy to be interrupted. Also, nobody ever calls me Professor Hellard, it's Margaret. Um, I looked about 12 when I graduated from medicine, so I never got called Dr Hellard either. And it just doesn't seem to work, does it, Bob? No. <laughs> um, so that's far away. Uh, always got stacks of people to acknowledge. And also, just so you realise, I have disclosures, I get investigator-initiated funding for a few of our pieces of work from Gilead Science and the NBMS. So just, you know, if I'm trying to tell you to, you know, buy shares in drugs. It's wrong. <laughs> hepatitis C, why do we give a toss? Can you hear me if I wander? Cool. I've got a reasonably loud voice, but I'll wander back to the microphone every now and then as well. So hepatitis C, why do we give a toss? Because lots of people die and lots of people are infected globally. So that's the first reason why we give a toss. And it impacts everywhere in the world. There's no country that doesn't have hepatitis C, like HIV, when some countries didn't have it, they did have it, they just got it a little later and then had massive epidemics. So nobody's immune because it's blood to blood spread. <laughs> Um, and sometimes it's from injecting drug use, but often it's also from health systems, um, which have been really um, both the, uh, what I'd call the tradition, sort of the formal and the informal health systems, where you've got reuse of needles and syringes um, as well in many places, Egypt being a classic example, which I'll touch on at some stage. So it's a big killer. Most people don't know it's a big killer because most of us don't know all sorts of things. Um, and so combined with hepatitis B, in fact, it's one of the biggest infectious diseases killers uh, globally. As I said, for Australia, I put this up because it's relevant for Australia, is our epidemic in Australia is predominantly driven by people who inject drugs, essentially not using clean needles and syringes every time you inject. Um, and that's invariably because we're stupid enough not to provide for children. So if you sort of think about just an aside, so this is a public health aside, and this will be always in your work, is that the most simple public health interventions that save the least amount of money, sorry, save the most amount of money, cost the least amount, are the most effective, invariably sit in the prevention field. Where do we spend most of our health dollars? Not in the prevention field. So that's the first thing. So we're sort of foolish, and that's at all levels of health services, government, the way we got trained as clinicians, all of those things. The least amount of training you would have got would have been in prevention. You would have learned about, I hope not, but Walden Slops cryoglobinemia, or, you know, like porphyria. The only time you'll ever need to know about porphyria is when you watch the movie The Madness of King George, which is excellent, but of not particular relevance to most of us. I mean, I'm a physician trained as well as public health trained. I ain't seen porphyria yet. I'm going to die not having seen porphyria, but spent more hours probably studying porphyria in my undergraduate and postgraduate years than studying public health properly. It's a really weird thing, and this is our problem, is that we actually don't have good prevention programs. And as soon as it becomes a bit what I'll call, or what my mother actually used to call, icky, as in why do I do diseases which are a bit icky, um, as in not socially acceptable, or how do I discuss this at dinner? Great. I really like it when I went to my PhD, which was just on drinking water. I could talk about water, much harder to talk about sex, HIV, drugs. And I did a rock and roll study every year for a while just so I could say I did sex, drugs and rock and roll. But it's... <laughs> and, and the reason that means that we don't fund it, despite the fact that needle and syringe programs are by far the most effective, cost-effective way to go anywhere. And yet there's a, globally, there's a real lack of political appetite to do it. So it's one of those challenges where policy is totally out of line with evidence and totally out of line with actually how much money you will save. So this is our biggest challenge, I always think, in public health, is that kind of moral judgment that gets brought in. And sometimes it's not even a moral judgment. Sometimes it's just like it suits me to have a large hospital department where I'm, you know, like the kingpin grown up and I don't want to give up something. It's a power issue as well as to where money gets spent. And also, I was having a meeting with a minister from the state government yesterday where politicians, it, the community expects us to build buildings. If you're a politician, you're not doing anything if you're not building a building. So if I build a hospital, I'm doing something about health because you're so stupid that you can see that I built a hospital because you couldn't in any way conceptualise that there might be another way to do it. 
um, we have a problem with law and order, allegedly. I'll build a prison. Well, that's about the dumbest dirt thing you can actually do to do with law and order. But geez, I'm doing something, I've built a prison. So this kind of thing of also for us to work with the community to say a solution to these problems is not building a big building, but actually a prevention. So it's not as sexy actually to have courts that see people faster, that move people along, that, um, that you have people being employed as diversion people, that you have midwives, maternal and health nurses thinking about a baby as opposed to locking them up at 12 and then 18 and then 38 and then 52 because their life course which began at birth was one where you weren't giving them the appropriate supports. As I said, I've just diverted my mind. But this is the issue, is it's preventable, but we don't. So sustainable development goals. Everybody will have heard about them, no doubt, and if you haven't, then you're going to fail your exams. No, I have no idea. Do <laughs> you actually have exams? Have exams? <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to fail your exams if you don't know about the sustainable development goals. Take them really seriously, okay? So we had the Millennium Development Goals. We had, you know, Bob Hawke just died. No child will die in poverty by whatever year it was. Was it 2000? Yeah. Turn off dying poverty. No child. So no child was to die in poverty. This is kind of the global equivalent of Bob Hawke's No Child Shall Die in Poverty. So all good things will be happening by 2030 and all of our countries signed on to them. So we're all going to be absolutely fabulously fantastic and no issues by 2030. So the post-development agenda. And in it, you've got number three, health. And in health, you've got ensure healthy lives and promote wellbeing for all ages. <laughs> um, that's good. Glad we're doing the right thing. And so by 2030, we are going to do just a couple of things. We're going to end the epidemics of AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, and neglected tropical diseases. Yep. And, sorry, should we be cynical? Yes, we are. Uh, and combat hepatitis, waterborne diseases, and other communicable diseases. And the really good thing about these is if you said, what is ending an epidemic? I actually don't exactly know what ending an epidemic is, but it's, good. it's a good word because we can't be held to it too hard. Okay? So, so if you think about what is ending an epidemic by technical epidemiological terms, if you go eliminate, no, eradicate, eliminate, combat. We've all got fancy technical terms. Will they fail the exam if they don't know those technical terms? Because you should fail if you don't know about sustainable development. But you don't actually have to know those except to know that that's why we use words like um, end because it's actually not got an epidemiological meaning which is handy because then we can go and combat. Like what does combat mean? I'm combating anything. So these things. The next thing though, but you should take it seriously because they're named and I take it seriously because I feel my life work on this. But I take it as seriously as I think it deserves when you see things written like this. So universal health coverage, another key part of the SDGs, is another key component of the SDGs, as I've just said and I've repeated myself, is achieved when all people receive health services they need, which are sufficient quality to make difference without those people incurring financial hardship. Now, this is the big gig, okay? Now, this to me, if I was to not give this talk today, but to give an entirely different talk today, is what we're going to actually be going for, is how do we ensure that globally, everybody can get appropriate health cover, that it does not impact on them or their family, so that they have catastrophic financial impacts on their lives. So not just do I, if I was in a some countries, if I was to get sick, it impacts on me, there's a cost to me personally, so there's my cost, but not just is there the cost to me as in how much does it cost for my medicine? It's the cost that I don't go to work. What's the cost so that I borrow money or my family borrows money for me? Actually, will they borrow money for me if I'm a 12-year-old girl or will I die? Will they borrow money for me if I'm a 15-year-old boy because I'm worth some more money? Will I live? Will they borrow money for the father but not the mother? So the catastrophic health costs that impact on places is enormous. And many countries now are looking for this universal health coverage of how do we work to get appropriate universal health coverage in countries so that you do not have catastrophic health costs for families. And this is a really important thing because if you think about it, if I have a catastrophic health cost in my life, I am in debt for the rest of my life. I am actually not buying stuff. So if you think about that country's development, I'm dead, I'm not working, I'm not buying stuff. I'm not looking after my mother. I'm not looking after the children. I'm not whatever it is. 
it's a catastrophic thing, but it impacts on economies and GDPs. So really interestingly, countries are thinking about this because there's actually a true economics about development that comes into this. And the example that would be given would be China, where the health cost for hepatitis B, so families know hepatitis B is quite prevalent in China, so families know that at some stage if we've got hepatitis B, we may have a health cost coming up. So in fact, we're going to have to save money for when we need to spend on that catastrophic health cost that we will send the family broke if we don't start to put money aside. So if you think about putting money aside over there to cover the potential catastrophic health cost, you're not putting it into the economy right now. So if I'm the, nothing to do with the economy, but I'm the Minister of Finance, I'm going, actually, I'd like you to spend your money now. I'm not spending my money now. I'm waiting for my catastrophic health cost. So China, in terms of their thinking through their hepatitis B response, took this into account and said it's actually worth us spending money for people to think that they're covered for their hepatitis B. Partly because we don't want people, you know, we're like nice, we don't want people to get sick and die of hepatitis B, but partly because we don't want them to be putting, putting a whole lot of money over there and not spending it now on our economy to build our economy. So these things are really interesting in the way one needs to think about them. So with the Sustainable Development Goals, people are really thinking through issues around um, these catastrophic health costs, what are the disease priorities for this particular country? What's the universal health coverage for this particular country? I'm doing some work at the moment and we're sort of looking at Pakistan, where hepatitis C is very common in Pakistan. And they're about to look at their SDGs and their universal health coverage. And what is in their disease control priority packages? So when they borrow money off the World Bank to actually say, I'm going to work out, you know, Imran Khan, great cricketer, good speed bowler. I mean, good speed bowler, reverse swing. Anyway. Come on, guys. <laughs> Not only that, maybe you'll be a reasonable leader of Pakistan. Yeah. He's looking at his SDGs at the moment. He's looking at his disease control packages and priorities. And one of the things we're trying to look at is to say, should hepatitis C be prioritised in that? Because this, for the country, is a catastrophic health cost. So these are the kind of things why you need to pretend to know about this. Anyway, that was a bit of just a health economics lecture as well. I like it. Um, so, WHO, because they were taking the SDG seriously and we had that combat viso, they said, okay, we're into this combating. Um, and so we are going to have a vision. And so they really set this as well by um, the World Health Assembly. So WHO was, had to say, you've got to do something about that hepatitis C business and that hepatitis B business. And so they said, well, right, we're going to do this. We're going to set a world where viral hepatitis transmission is stopped and everyone living with hepatitis has access to safe, affordable, effective care and treatment. Woo! And eliminate hepatitis C, viral hepatitis, as a major public health threat. Now, this is really cool. Eliminate as a major public health threat, which means you don't actually have to eliminate which means if you eliminate something, you have to get rid of it totally from a place. Well, it's like not impossible to eliminate it by a public health threat by 2030 because it's a chronic disease. But if you think about what does that mean, maybe I've impacted on transmission. So they set some targets. They said, we're going to reduce the number of new infections from up here, 2015, by, to 90%, and we're going to reduce deaths by 65%. So it's not really eliminate in a classical epidemiological terminology of elimination. But it's doing a lot. And the idea is if you get it down to here, then you really are impacting going forward. I was fortunate to be in the room as we set these targets. And for hep C, it's not 90%, it's 80%. When we set, when we're looking at the models to set these targets. And I can remember just thinking, like, you know, when you're going, oh, okay, we're going to have a shot at this, are we? I mean, it's pretty interesting conversation as to what is a reasonable thing. What can you reasonably think that you can achieve? by 2030, if you decided to turn your mind to it. This is entirely separate to actually, what will you achieve? Because a lot of places won't turn their minds to it. What will, what will we reasonably think we could achieve if we did turn our mind to it, if we did begin to do vaccination, if we did begin to do treatment where appropriate? They reckon we can make this. And I actually reckon that that's the case, if we decide to. And for hepatitis C, 90% of chronic infections diagnosed. So you've got to test. A lot of people, we're not doing it climate. You've got to treat the hepatitis C, a lot of people. And you've got to do this needle and syringe program, you've got to do OST, and you've got to strengthen your health systems. It's really, really important that you get health system strengthening, both, as I said, in the formal and the informal health system. Because in many places in the world, the informal health system is the health system that people on low incomes are using, the most vulnerable in our populations. Now, why is hepatitis C elimination, now I'll focus on hepatitis C elimination, possible? because of this extraordinary game changer. There is a cure for hepatitis C. 
Now, when I started out in medicine um, back in the... 86. I was going to say thanks. I was just thinking, where did I do medicine? <laughs> I was going to say in the early 80s, and then we graduated in 86. HIV was the big, a big, big thing coming through. And it was one of the things that had really kept, sort of caught my mind. I was not a big, very good medical student. In fact, I was a very poor medical student. Most things bored me. I should be honest. And the only time that I found it really interesting, because if you look it up in a book, like you were made to learn facts that you would look up in a book, I just think, why can't I look it up in a book? Anyway, apart from that kind of detail, um, <laughs> well, now you can look it up on Google. Like, I'm actually correct. Up to date. Like, you're already clinic. Oh, I think I'll just look up up to date. Um, it's like, you can't keep it in your mind. Like, that's a dumb, dumb thing. It's a waste of mind space, in my view, as well. Because you get distracted from the thing you meant to do, which is actually, let's think about it, think. Anyway, apart from that minor detail, I was a very poor medical student. The only things that really interested me, I mean, I learned, I passed. It's not like you passed. But the thing that really interested me is when everybody said, this is not examinable. As soon as somebody said, this is not examinable, I'm thinking, right, we're going to hear the first interesting thing for the week. And invariably it was, and this is when we first heard about HIV. I remember the lecture to this day, John Peterson, pathology, fourth year. This is not examinable. Woo! Became examinable pretty damn fast. But the thing is, everybody died. One of the biggest breakthroughs that happened was when the drugs stopped people dying. I remember coming back from having, um, I've got three kids, from having my twins and came back in 96. Before that, every time I looked after these, who I got into public health, because all my patients died. All the young men I was seeing were going to die. From 86 onwards, they were all dying. And I can remember just working with them, working with their families, working with their mothers. So I can remember just thinking, my gosh, because I had young children at the time, this feeling that this lovely young man was <coughs> going to die. And I remember in 96 when we came back, we had the new treatments. And I can remember at the time thinking, how about we do a little prevention? Like, you know, how do we work on prevention? How do we work on our early diagnosis? How does the public health response need to be for this disease? So that's where I went to public health. And so coming back in 96 when we had a, not a cure to get rid of it, but a cure to keep people alive was a really amazing thing. And I can remember thinking, this is probably the most amazing medical breakthrough I'm ever going to see in my life. I was wrong. I'm wrong about a lot of things. Um, this is actually the most amazing medical breakthrough from my perspective that I'm going to see in my lifetime. People who died of hepatitis C and who we used to poison with pegylated interferon and ribavirin, we now cure. 95% plus cure. It's extraordinary. You get cured and you don't get it back. You can get reinfected, but you don't get it back. You are cured. So it's not like, hmm, oh, lingering there. Well, it is. Every virus can play some to your all that kind of shit. But apart from those kind of like, kind of immunological kind of cool things, it's actually cured. Eight to 12 weeks of therapy, one to three tablets, depending on which brand you use. It's extraordinary. Low, low side effects. So this means we can eliminate. Because if you can cure people of a chronic infection, then you're on your way. If you put in prevention methods to actually go, oh, I'll stop you getting reinfected, you're well and truly on your way. It'd be nice to have a vaccine, which I'll possibly, if I don't get distracted and don't run out of time as I look at the clock. How long am I speaking for? No. Okay. Um, uh, I'll, I'll tell you about it. But actually, vaccine studies have just come out this year. No, it didn't work. Anyway, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> but doesn't mean we don't keep trying. Um, anyway, uh, where was I with this? Oh, yes. So if you think about your public health programs, this is entirely doable because you can cure. And if you think about who you should focus on curing, which I'm about to come to, is you can actually use a treatment as prevention approach. And in the same way as in HIV, we use a treatment as prevention approach. You go, I treat you, and that gives you an individual benefit. That's always the first thing. I treat you, and that gives you the individual benefit. The patient gets primary focus on that. But if I treat you, and your virus is no longer there, also, you don't get to transmit this virus to somebody. It seems like bleedingly obvious, but you'd be surprised how many people this is not bleedingly obvious to, particularly if they're a person who is undeserving. So obviously people who inject drugs are undeserving people. I don't know whether you're aware of that, but they are undeserving. <laughs> abused so by many folk. There are many folk in the world who are undeserving. Prisoners are undeserving. Um, people who inject drugs are undeserving. People who keep on doing the same thing, and this I do this with medical students, people who do the same thing over and over and over and over again despite knowing that they shouldn't be doing it or undeserving. Which is why I personally think we should empty the hospitals and anybody coming back in for a second CAG, we should empty the persons coming in who come back in who've been diagnosed with their diabetes but don't take their insulin properly. I think we should empty the hospitals of anybody who uh, has secondary diabetes due to overweight because we've all been told to exercise and eat less and eat more vegetables and all that kind of thing. 
when I say that, it seems so stupid, doesn't it? Like, you've got to go, that is the dumbest thing that that woman's ever said. It's not. I've seen a lot stubborn. But what I'm saying is it seems stupid. But if you said, oh, actually, I need to treat a person to inject drugs, oh, they'll just get reinfected. Yeah, they will. Maybe, maybe not. So tell me what your problem is. Because if they get reinfected, guess what I'll do? I'll treat them again. Oh, yeah, but then they'll get infected again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guess what? I've got something outrageous to say. To you. I'll treat them again. And again. And again. And again. I'll say, oh, these drugs are too expensive. I'll tell you a story about that in a moment. And I'll say, but how much is your CAX to my drugs? Oh, yeah, but they're deserving. Oh, are they deserving? Why are they deserving? Who's the undeserving? So say if I got sexually abused when I was eight. And then because nobody copes with that and we all pretended it didn't happen, blah, 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 God, drugs. Am I deserving? Oh, yeah, she's deserving. Okay, so I can treat her. Okay, so say something yucky happened to that bloke. Like maybe his father bashed him. Is he deserving? Oh, yeah, okay, I can treat him. Okay. So, like, we get a very complicated thing as to the deserving and the undeserving. The only person who is the undeserving poor, if you think about go back and watch Pete Malium, Eliza Doolittle's father did not want to become part of the deserving poor. He wanted to be undeserving and stay as a garbage man drinking too much. And he's the only person I've come across, which I'm going to classify because he wanted to be as the undeserving poor. The rest are all deserving. But we make them undeserving and we make judgments about who should get health care on whether or not they will take it properly. And who are we to judge? Really, who are we to judge? Like, you've got to get a grip. I mean, like we're all here on a Saturday morning when we've all been told to work less and exercise more. <laughs> <laughs> just, just saying. Anyway, none of the models made any sense to me. I almost became a mathematical medical model at one stage, but I got distracted, as I often do. But... I worked with a guy called Peter Vickerman when I was doing my training for mathematical modelling. And he came up with finally the model, only model that made sense to me. And what Peter's model said is, which I think is a really important thing to understand, is this treatment as prevention issue, is you do not have to treat everybody immediately to get an epidemic to reduce its prevalence. So if you've got a background prevalence of hepatitis C, 20, 40, 60%, you can significantly reduce prevalence, not by treating everybody today, but by over time treating, say, 5 or 10 or 20 per, and 40 per thousand people who injected drugs. So what it meant, Australia's prevalence sits about here, is we did not have to treat everybody immediately. But if we treated 40 people, and this is with the old drugs, so this is in 2012 Peter's model. I remember when Peter did this model, came out and we were talking about it, was present, we were sort of doing some work in Australia. And, and I saw this model, it came out for a CRE. I can remember just, and this is before we had cure, but I knew cure was coming. I called Rosemary Lester, who was the chief health officer at the time, I said, Rosemary, I think we can eliminate hepatitis C from Victoria. Do you want to come and listen to this talk? Um, I'll, we'll come to you. And I can remember presenting it to her, trying to get Rosemary terribly excited. She was not the slightest interested in hepatitis C. But it didn't matter. I was excited. We could all become excited. I didn't have to excite everybody at the same moment. It's a bit like this. You don't have to treat everybody at the same moment. You don't have to excite everybody at the same moment. But it suddenly struck me, we can actually have a shot at this. And Australia is the best place to have a shot at it because we have universal health coverage, we have heart reduction and all this, even with the old crappy meds. And we were also, I was experimenting with doing treatment in community at that stage, even with the old crappy meds, because we had all these rules. I always think of them as guidelines. Uh, had all these rules about where you're allowed to treat people, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. A bit like the college of doesn't have the college of rules. <laughs> you do. Um, anyway, so a lot of rules about what I was allowed to do, what I was not allowed to do, so I took no notice of any of them, and we just treated people in the community. So we proved that we could treat people in the community, people who injected drugs. I remember presenting at a gastro conference where somebody accused me of medical negligence for treating people who injected drugs. You are medically negligent. I thought, gee, thanks. I don't think I am, though. Oh, because here, guess what? I've done all the literature reviews to say that people who inject drugs treatment outcomes are just as good as non-people who inject drugs. Where's your evidence to say that I'm negligent? Oh, you haven't done a study. Oh, okay. I did it really nicely though. I was very polite. Very polite. Not cynical. Not a, not a cynical sound in my voice. Except just to go, the evidence would suggest that I'm right and you're wrong. And that's really important. Because again, it's judgment. People who inject drugs can't cope. Of course they can cope. They're not idiots. But they're good at taking drugs is what I saw people. <laughs> <laughs> the other role and we think about it is you think about who are we treating and how did they get infected you do not get a hepatitis C from the immaculate conception so this comes as this treatment as prevention component okay so when you think about any disease and I'm just using as I said um sorry is that a non I shouldn't have said non yeah that's really just I didn't say that immaculate conception thing. um <laughs> 
you, you do not get disease all on your own. It's like you've not got disease. Well, actually, you can, sort of, but not from this blood or So you go, who to whom am I getting this infection? So the thing that was really interesting to me is going, well, if we take a treatment as prevention for HIV, for hepatitis C, for you know, even TV, the actual networks of TV, anything that's airborne is also interesting, network stuff. Do some really nice stuff with flu, actually, around, you know, when the last flu epidemic was in Victoria and actually how that transmitted. And, you know, it's in the schools and stuff. And then you look at the trams and you look at where people go and play sports, adolescents playing sports. We're totally stuffed, can I just say, if we have a really bad flu epidemic because we don't think about it right most of the time. And then second, Australians don't do what they're told. And so this kind of thing of you're going to be quarantined, unless they actually see people die in front of them, and they're not going to quarantine themselves. They're going back to work. So just the, I don't know if any of you do flu. I was in the department when we had swine flu. It was yeah, hilarious. It was hilarious. Like, I mean, no joke. But the network stuff was really interesting. I published on that. Yeah. Like, we were looking at, but just, just to give you a heads up, nobody's going to listen to you ever if it doesn't suit them. It's like ourselves. Like, if you think about yourself and your life, this is what I always say to somebody. You only do what you're told or what somebody tells you to do when you're planning to do that anyway. Very rarely. If you reflect back on the last day, week, month, year, 10, 50 years, 56, I can't remember how long, <laughs> just for the hell it was, last 56 years, um, you only do what you're told mostly when you were planning to do it anyway. How many people have you stopped smoking? How many people have you made exercise? How many people have you got to work harder when they needed to or do anything unless that was their plan in the first place? Keep that in mind when you're setting rules. Uh-uh. Not going to follow. Anyway, back to this. So that was another public health lecture aside. Is it doing the right thing there? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, not, I'm not sure what I meant to be talking about, really. Uh, anyway, so this is really interesting, though. So essentially, you don't get hepatitis C from nowhere. You get it from somebody else. So what we did is we followed the networks of people injected drugs over a couple of years and actually said, who are you? I'm injecting drugs. Okay, cool. We'll recruit you. And we, this took ages. We've got people out working very hard in the field who are very familiar with the sector. And then you go, okay, with whom do you inject drugs? And they say, oh, you know, Rob. Good. So um, they talk to me now. So Rob, uh, I, they go, oh, there's Rob. And Rob comes in, so oh, yeah. And who do you inject with? Oh, I also inject with Michelle. I'll inject with Tara today as well. And then Tara and Michelle say they inject together. You really shouldn't. They share an office. They shouldn't inject drugs together. They should use clean And so you begin to build up your network. And you go, why should I give a toss about this? But what you're asking is, does the network influence how you can think about an elimination program? Because if you have a dense network, is that going to make it easier or more difficult to actually cure? And who do I actually treat first? And what we found is, and because I'm a really simple girl, is that the network effect this is doing jacks it nothing. And then if you say we're going to treat people randomly, but if you treat using a network effect, rather than just treating somebody randomly, just forgetting about who they inject with, um, you actually have a greater impact on prevalence. And again, this was using the old drugs. And essentially what it told us, we looked at all sorts of places of where did you sit in the network? Did you have more, like, were you the person who was hepatitis C and had more people who had hepatitis C? Were you the people who had less people with hepatitis C? Blah, 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 blah. But I just thought, okay, that's not how my life works. When I'm at clinic, I'm not going to ask somebody, where do you sit within your network? And do you know their outcome? Like, it's just not going to work. So I just called this a treat your friends approach. And it was just, do you have any mates that we should treat? And if you just said, I'll just treat your friends, it actually had a big impact on reducing prevalence. So this is where through Peter's models and our modeling globally, we realized that a treatment as prevention approach for hepatitis C could be highly effective in eliminating hepatitis C. So when these new drugs began to come in, we began to say, ask the question, okay, well, let's use that. But can we eliminate? And we looked at Australia as an example because that's obviously because we're Australian. But this had this was important because it had a low impact. And this has been a very highly cited paper for those that aren't into these things. Guts a really good journal, and um, and it's a, a well regarded paper in terms of. And the key thing was this: you get people, you get to treat people, and you go, that's good. And then you say, well, I can't let people die because that. So you're saying, I want. What happens if we do nothing? have lots of deaths, we're not getting anywhere near that 20-30 target, and you have lots of infection, okay? So you say, okay, well, I'm going to treat people with really significant disease. I'm going to do the deaths. I'm going to stop that death 65% thing. So that's a good thing to do. So you say, okay, well, I'm going to treat people with advanced liver disease. And I'm going to stop the deaths. So we got the deaths target, but we didn't get the um, new infection target. 
and that was treating about 5,500 people a year, 5,600. So we said, how about if we treat people who inject drugs, don't worry about the deaths business. And really interestingly, is yes, we only have to treat less than 5,000 people who injected drugs in Australia per year to get to our elimination targets. And in fact, we did get to our death target as well, totally by chance, because of the way the model works. But you had this sort of little pick up of deaths here, a bit more than people would like. So you go, okay, that's not going to be very palatable for the community to only treat people who inject drugs. The Minister for Health is not going to give us that gig. Um, but how about if we do a combination? If you treat people who inject drugs, and for five years you treat late disease, how are we going to go? And what we found is that we were very successful at basically going, we hit our elimination targets for, um, for prevalence, so we've got the new cases right now, we get rid of the deaths, and we also don't have that little blip in the middle before we get rid of the deaths. A very palatable thing. So essentially saying, entirely doable for Australia. You do not have to do much to get here, you just have to concentrate. Now that is actually a hard thing to do, most of us can't concentrate. So, this has been going on since 2015. In, the drugs became available, I'll tell you the straight story in a moment, in 2016. But as of last year, not everybody was doing well. Alphabetical order, Australia's on top, yay. Australia, <laughs> and Egypt, France, Georgia, Iceland, Italy, Japan, Mongolia, Netherlands, Spain, Switzerland, UK. Now the Netherlands are doing well because they stopped having people who injected drugs back in the 1980s. I was giving a talk once in the Netherlands about something, I was talking to a group that I do work with there, and this kind of Asperger-y type of person said at the table, she was just so funny, oh, injecting drug use, it's so 80s. I so wanted to write an article, it's the only place that doesn't do injecting drug use, but for some reason they stopped, they used, they, they inhaled instead. So no new cases, so they won't actually reach, which is another story, they won't actually reach the WHO targets because I'd already reached them. So you can't actually get a 90% reduction in new incidence infections if you don't actually have incident infection. We're just writing an article on that at the moment. You have to be mindful of these things. Like, you didn't reach a target thing, no, because I already had. Um, uh, Egypt had a massively different epidemic. Fascinating. I'll touch on it in a moment. France is doing a good job because they've been doing a good job for a while. Georgia, I'm on their technical, actually, chair their technical advisory group. The government just decided, you know what, we're just going to try and eliminate. And they got given some drugs. Iceland is a pissy little small country, as many of you would know. About 300,000 to 400,000. I'm an advisor to Iceland. It is a fantastic fund because it's your classical island. Like you go, it's, and we call it micro-elimination. Like Iceland's got like one, less than 1,000 cases and we're trying to eliminate it. And it's like, you know, like you do those studies on an island as your yeah, epidemiological experiment with, you know, measles and whatever. You look at the epidemics, oh, that's nice. It goes away and then it comes back again and all that kind of stuff. So Iceland is brilliant for that. Uh, Italy, I don't believe. Uh, Jan <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just going to say, I just don't believe it fully, but that's okay. Uh, but they've got a good price of their drugs. Japan is very organised. Mongolia is similar to Georgia, decided they're just going to do it. And it's really interesting when countries decide they're going to do things. Spain um, is doing pretty well. Switzerland, Switzerland, so of course they're organised and we will plan to eliminate. And, uh, and the UK have recently got their shit together. So that's the summary. So what are the barriers for us from achieving it, though? I'm going to move along. When these prices came out, some of you will know and some of you won't. Gilead, who came up with the first drug, it was this thing, $1,000 a pill. It's a bit like that stupid gene therapy for 100, losing what's a million dollars at the moment, I've forgotten what it's called. Arty. Sorry? Arty. That's right. Like, $1,000 a pill. $1,000 a pill. Like, what a dumb thing, okay? Like, remember at the time going, that really is annoying, because this is cure, and now we're going to have to have an argument. And I said this, I have said this to senior people at Gilead. When you made this decision to make it $1,000 a pill, you caused no end of grief for two to three years. You put us back two to three years because you came up with a brilliant cure. And Gilead has not always been the worst of companies. No drug company is pure, it's, you know, whatever. But there's worse ones than others. Ones that are worse than others. Gilead hasn't, they've done good things with HIV in Africa in terms of what we'll go into. But $1,000 a pill. And you go, this is annoying because you've got drug development costs, you've got marketing approval, and you've got price. This is what the companies have every right to make money. We will not get new drugs without knowing. But the thing is, you've got to then go, uh, it's a bit like Pirates of the Caribbean. I'm very upset that Jeffrey Rush is not somebody that I can now quote in the same way as I used to. It's really annoying because I used to like Jeffrey Rush and Pirates of the Caribbean. It's, it's Captain Bob Ross. It's just the beginning of negotiation. You remember with the, the coins and it's like the beginning of a negotiation. There's always a negotiation to be had. Drug pricing is a negotiation. And you've got to work out how, what are the rules of the game? And most of you may not go into this area, but if you decide that you're going to somehow have to get your head around drugs, because I suddenly had to get my head around drug pricing because this became part of the rules of the game. 
I wrote a paper so I could explain it to myself and others. And so that paper by Caitlin Douglas, BMC Medicine 2018, is a really simple paper to read because I had to be able to understand it because I was the senior author. But it's really to explain drug pricing. How do you engage in drug pricing negotiation? Because you've got all of these other things. You can have centralised price negotiation, you can have licensing, joint procurement, personal importation schemes. You can disrupt through personal importation schemes. There's all different ways. So to me, these are the things that as public health people, nobody's going to tell you you're not going to get, you know, this is not the type of thing you can be examined on. But if you want to go, how do I think about how things are structured and how things are prices, this is a really key one as to how, if it's $1,000 a pill, do we change it from being $1,000 a pill? Because it's not to stay at $1,000 a pill and it didn't stay at $1,000 a pill. And we knew through the HIV drugs where there was massive negotiation, campaigning and the like, but they went from being expensive to ensuring that Africa could afford them. So nothing is has to be the price you get told it is. And you can do things through intellectual property laws, the TRIPS agreement. I, have, I don't know whether you get ever talked about, about the TRIPS agreement, but these things, this is a trade agreement, kind of thing that Donald Trump's driving everybody nuts about at the moment, okay? And it's the kind of thing that we have to keep in mind when we have negotiations with the United States about drugs. But making sure trade-related aspects of intellectual property is really, really important, things like TRIPS agreement. Because am I allowed to negotiate a price down? And when can I break the TRIPS agreement? Because you are allowed to. You'll be told, oh, there's a TRIPS agreement. You're not. Yes, you can. You can break a TRIPS agreement through compulsory licensing and public non-commercial licences. That's what South Africa threatened to do to do with HIV drugs because the people would die. And that's what other countries have done to do with HIV drugs. And Malaysia, in fact, said we will compulsory licence because we're not a poor country and you're not giving it to us at a low price in terms of the licensed generic which are being made because licensed generics make something cheaper. That's how a drug company says, for poor countries, I'll give you a licensed generic. So it's an Indian manufacturer or a... Uh, China manufacturer or Pakistan manufacturer makes the drugs, whatever drug it might be, at a much lower price. And then they have agreements as to what countries can access them. But if you're a middle income country, and you don't have to be too rich to be a middle income country, you may not get a, um, that, that um, license, voluntary license scheme. You might be part of it. So Malaysia is not included in part of the voluntary license scheme. They say, hang on, tick, this is going to send us broke, and we want to cure people. We want to actually get on this elimination bad work. So they did compulsory licensing. And really interestingly, when Malaysia said, we're doing compulsory licensing, Mr Gilead and a few others, um, they go, oh, well, we'll give you uh, part of the voluntary license scheme and all the countries around you. So what it did is one country saying, we're compulsory licensing, caused a kind of a domino effect for all the middle income countries around the world. So you must know you're allowed to do this. Compulsory licensing, voluntary licensing and patent opposition. We must not accept when something comes out at $1,000 a pill that that's the end of the conversation. And it wasn't the end of the conversation. And from $1,000 a pill, and I reckon there's probably only three people in the United States that ever paid $1,000 a pill, because their insurers negotiated, they weren't going to pay $1,000 a pill. I mean, there's maybe more than three, maybe five. No, um, their, their insurers negotiated everywhere. Australia did, we had a fierce, scary negotiator. She really scared me slightly. <laughs> and, and, and essentially Australia, that's when I also got accused of causing untold deaths in Australia. I was causing deaths because I was saying, we want a universal access. We don't want it because this is because it's so expensive when it first came out. You don't want to have it. People saying, "Oh, it's too expensive. It'll make the health system go broke." And I said, "Don't accept the price. We want it for everybody, not just people with severe liver disease. Because if we don't treat people with mild liver disease who are involved in transmission, we will not eliminate." So you needed everybody. It needed to be a public health response rather than a severe disease response. So we needed these prices to come down. So we held out in Australia and we got the best price, the best price, I won't go into details for one of the time today, but the best price um, in, in developed world kind of uh, economies and set the standard for others for a couple of years. So it's a really great thing that we did in Australia. Prices have come right down. And in fact, less than $100. In Pakistan, you can get treatment for $50 a cure. So $1,000 a pill, $50 a cure in three years. So this is where you get reminded, accept nothing, don't agree with it, don't be, don't be agreeable all of the time because people will die and we will not get rid of an epidemic. You still have dumb rules. So price was an issue, price is no longer an issue. But you still have dumb rules and dumb insurance companies and dumb things. None of this is evidence-based. And again, our job is to call it out. 
non-evidence-based, oh, you can't have it because you're a person who injects drugs. You can't have it because you're a person who injected drugs once upon a time. You can't have it because you drink alcohol. It's just garbage. Each time somebody says, you can't do this, you say, can I have the evidence for that? Like, where is the evidence that you sitting in front of me on Saturday morning will make you a better public health? I don't know. I'm just asking, where's the evidence? Where is the evidence that you need to have a Masters of Public Health before you start training, when I actually don't have one? Just like, put it out there. I actually don't have one. Um, makes you a better public health physician. Just say, where's the evidence? Um, I, I ask these questions all of the time of people. I think we have to always be making sure that somebody's not making a rule that's not evidence-based. I don't mind, but I think we have to be really careful about it. In all things, because I can trust me, nuts rules. I mean, tra traffic accidents, traffic, totally understand, good evidence. I go faster, I'm more likely to make you get sick up if I hit you, and I'm more likely to hit you. Good evidence, I'll take that one. You know what I mean? Like, that's a rule that makes some sense. But there's a whole lot of other stuff that we just get drawn in that's just like, there's no evidence for that. So people will tell you, you can't do that, or you shouldn't do that, or you're going to cause a problem here. Show me the evidence. You may be right, but show me the evidence before you make a rule that precludes somebody from health care that they want. You're not forcing health care on them, but if I want to be treated, you prove to me that I can't be treated. The only thing I ever worked out with people who did or didn't get one treatment is in people would say, oh, what, how do you make a judgment as to whether somebody can be treated? I said, they're sitting in front of me and they're asking for treatment. You usually find that a pretty good measure. Well, what about, uh, well, yeah, yeah, they're sitting there. And if you're not sitting there, you're not asking for it, I've got to think about how to get treatment to you so that you might be more likely to ask it. But the best way to judge whether or not you should ever provide clinical care to somebody is actually if they're asking for it. Pretty good measure is what I've found over the years because they come back and they come back again because actually they would like you to treat them. So clear evidence that you can cure people who are on drugs, inject drugs, <laughs> real world study trials, because that's what they'll say, well, that was in a trial. What happens in real world? Real world, same thing. Our biggest thing is many people are not aware of it. So another big barrier, people don't know it's there. Ways forward. Raise awareness. And raise awareness in a way that makes sense to the populations that we're talking to. So there's no point in doing it on, I'm just trying to think of, no point in running ads probably. It might be actually, who knows, I might be being judgy on Fox News. Um, <laughs> work with the community. Multi-prompt approach. Make sure you understand what works. Harm reduction works, safe injecting facilities work, opiate substitution therapy works, needle and syringe programs work. But as you'll see, most countries sit not up there in all sorts of weird places. As I said, this is politics. This is politics, this is fear, this is really weird stuff, this is not evidence, this is not clinical evidence. And you know, people say, oh, well, if you just make needle and syringe programs available, needle and syringes available, people will reject more drugs. Clearly not true. Clearly, clear, clear, super clear evidence that OST and NSPs do not make more people inject drugs. Okay? Just opposite evidence. And in Portugal, where drugs have been decriminalised, drug use went down. Only one country that have a sensible drug policy in the world. So, testing is an issue. If we don't test enough people, we don't have testing programs that suit people, we will not get there. People say, oh, well, can't they just go into the hospital? I'll say, how many of you have had your six monthly dental checks? And how are we meant to go to the dentist every six months? Bet you, if I got you to put your hand up, most of you wouldn't. How many of you exercise daily? How many of you do all of the things that we're told we're meant to do and we don't? So work by Nick Scott, who does, you know, a group who does a whole lot of the modelling, clearly shows that we will not be successful unless we increase the number of people undergoing testing both the antibody test and the RNA test. For want of time, I won't bore you with this because this is sort of details that you don't specifically need to know, but more about public health. What you do need to know is, again, there are rules. Pathologists will like it that a test is perfect. <coughs> it's their instinct. And they will like it that it gets done at their pathology lab. It's their instinct. And it needs to be a perfect test. It's their instinct. Now, I'm just going to throw out a question to you. And I, was on the, I chaired the WHO guidelines for... Um, testing for B and C, so the guidelines as to what tests. And even as I was doing them, I was very aware that I was being made to make it that this has to be a really good test, rapid point of care tests there. My question to you is, who cares if the test, if I have a cure that costs $50, who cares if I treat a few extra people if I'm causing no side effects, if it means more people get tested in a country program? Why does the test have to be perfect? 
Sometimes a test has to be perfect, but it doesn't need to be perfect all the time, but we get taught it has to be perfect. All I'm saying to you is think about it in your public health programs. When does a test need to be perfect and when does it not need to be quite so perfect? And so we're doing some work around some of this, the point of care tests, rapid point of care tests, how do you get them done in community? What's the best way to do it? But the message I just want to throw to you is sometimes your instinct, and my instinct is you need a high sensitivity, high specificity. That's the test we need. You can't actually have that rapid point of care test out in that community because it's not as good as that test over there, and that's a very naughty thing. And then you sort of go, hang on, take a three about 12 steps back and go through the door. Um, maybe not if the less perfect test means a vast majority of people get tested and say it's got 97 rather than 99% sensitivity and specificity or whatever it is. It's not a shitty test, but it's not a perfect test. But that is cheaper, it's more available, and it means that I can do, and I say I treat an extra one in 100. But for the benefit in terms of programs, maybe that just makes sense. Things just to keep in your mind. So we've been playing around. I won't go because I'm being distracted and I'm running late essentially looking at rapid point of care tests and point of care tests. And the take home message that we got with this study, and the best reason why also if you're doing public health and you're doing public health research, always do a feasibility study because mostly you're wrong. What are your assumptions are? And that's why you do them. Because you sort of think, oh, you do them. Oh, I better do a pilot because I always have to. And then you remind yourself you do a pilot because you're often wrong. And the pilot helps you work out what, because you're working with human beings. And it's just so annoying when you're working with human beings because they just, as I said, do as they please. So you work out how do you work with a community clinic? How do you work with nursing staff or community staff training? But also the punter. The punter says, oh, you think a rapid point of care test is 10 minutes? Yeah, I'll give you 10 minutes. You think a rapid point of care test, when I'm just coming to get needles and syringes or do something, is 90 minutes? I don't know about you, but I ain't calling that rapid. I'm pissing off. And they did. So you had to work out a way to get them the message. 90 minutes is not rapid when you're not expecting to sit for 90 minutes. I suspect, I don't know what the cut point of rapid is, but I was reflecting on it. I was thinking, God, I'm an idiot. I mean, like, again, for the minutes of multiple times, you just think, what on earth was I thinking? If I went into a place and somebody said, you can have this, can you wait around 90 minutes? It's like, like you're kidding me, aren't you? I haven't had to spend 90 minutes in my day since I was 12. You know, like, you know what I mean? Like, none of us have 90 minutes. Oh, yeah, I've just suddenly got spare 90 minutes. Like, no. And the assumption was, and this is my assumption, this is my thing, oh, what are they doing? Well, they're picking up their kids. What are they doing? Actually, I'm picking up needles to inject drugs right now because I feel like it, I'm hanging out. Oh, OK, yeah, good point. Oh, well, I don't know. I'm going to try and get some money to pay for my next year. Yeah, yeah, that's, good. that's a good reason. Uh, just doing some shopping, mm, got to pay a bill, got another person, got another point. Like, we make assumptions about people's time. They don't have it. It wasn't rapid. So rapid, I don't know what rapid is. I've decided rapid is probably 10 minutes. Treat, no one by the model of care. I got told, as I said, at one stage I was medically negligent for treating people in the community. And you have no idea how hard it is to change health systems because it's in my vested interest at the hospital because I get measured by activity-based funding. If I'm active, just see lost patients, do some notes, see more patients, do some activity, make a phone call, do some more notes in the computer. That's my activity. That's how I get paid. That's how my registrar gets paid. That's how I get a beginner. We're very active. Lots of activity going on here. <laughs> it's good activity. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that activity. It's just you shouldn't be doing it. That activity, because the punter doesn't want to go and see you in your fancy tertiary hospital that costs $40 to park in or however many dollars and they wait all day for you to maybe get there from your ward round or your x-ray round. I think that's so and so. Um, you know, we've all been there. We've all come to our patients late. Um, and that you sit, you ask the person to sit there three hours. Oh, there's another three hours. Well, actually, I don't actually get paid by the, um, like an income like you do. I get paid as a casual because that's the life of many of us in the gig economy. And you're asking me, so I've just lost $60 for parking, or 50 depending. I've just lost four hours of work, average wage. So that appointment just cost somebody probably $300. Might have had to pay for childcare. I, I don't know what, but they don't want to come. They're not coming. And I've got data that show they're not coming. I won't go into all of it. But if you ask Professor Hellard, or Professor so-and-so, Actually, I want you to give up all of your clinics and put them in the community, run for the hills. It's a really hard thing to change health systems 
to say how does care happen where patients actually want to receive care? Because I have a vested interest to protect my unit. I don't mean to, I'm a nice person, really nice person, possibly, but I don't want to give stuff up. And when somebody like me comes along and says, actually, I think you need to move, actually, this clinic probably would be better off if you're only one or two of you and your nurses don't stay here but go over there, maybe you train them, maybe help, like, and the nurses are going, I don't want to go out there. Like, I've been coming to this hospital for 25 years and you want me to go outside and drive my car to a clinic in the community and work with people that I don't know. It's really hard work. But you can treat from a van. We've got nurses that do. And our outcomes are just as good as if they were at my tertiary hospital. You might say that I'm a really shit doctor, that's not. But we've done a community base where we actually did a comparison. So it's amazing what you have to prove to people. I have a research career, in my view, proving the bleedingly obvious. If somebody said to me, what have I done all my life? I've proved the bleeding the obvious. Tell me to go, I'm going to have to provide evidence that we all know, because we know what we're like ourselves, that if I have something wrong with me, and I could possibly be treated a kilometre up the road, but the local <coughs> doctor, or at the local community centre, something that's familiar to me, that's what I prefer, as opposed to going up to a tertiary hospital. But you'd be surprised globally, most of the treatment still occurs in tertiary hospitals. So we did a study to prove it. What we all know, but we don't want to know, is this. So the prime study, essentially we randomised people in the community to have to go up to the tertiary hospital for their care or to stay in the community and get all their care. And what we found is number one, it was statistically significant that more people stayed on treatment, so, sorry, started treatment and more people stayed on treatment and got cured. Funny thing if you stayed in the community as opposed to going up to the tertiary hospital. This has just been published in CID. It's a wonderful <coughs> study. It's just the dumbest study you can think about it. Like, I mean, you go like, da, Fred. My kids would go like, what are you doing? And I'm going, yeah, I have to change the WHO guidelines. So, because it means it can go into a guideline. Because it's a randomised control trial, high quality evidence, high impact. Take it seriously. John Dillon doing great work in the UK, doing similar kind of stuff, going, actually, in the UK, because the pharmacists are allowed to prescribe, maybe we just go, you're getting picking up your OST. We'll treat you as you pick up your OST. What are simple ways to treat people depending on where they are? Project Echo by Sandro Rora, similar stuff. Actually, he found people in Mexico, New Mexico, big state, big distances to travel. Telehealth, they do just as well he, in terms of getting good outcomes as people coming into clinics. So these are really important studies because you'd be surprised the vested interests that we have to fight against. Prisons, we like to lock people up when they have mental health issues, drug and alcohol issues, lots of problems. And every day, and then we do drop, lock up a really, really bad person that should be there. Which is good. And I'm not against having prisons. I actually think prisons are really, really important. But we actually, we've gone from having a couple of thousand prisoners in our state 10 or so years ago to 6,000 who are about to build a new prison. And we really have to reflect on what we're doing. And are we actually taking this seriously? These are some of the, the, dis the over-representation of mental health, the over-representation of wards of the state, the over-representation of drug use. If you think about it, a ward of the state, the over-representation of our Aboriginal community. If you think about it, a ward of the state meant that that person was our responsibility, ours. And we've managed to make it that a disproportionate number end up incarcerated. This is a really unacceptable thing that none of us are choosing to address. But if we're to see one little good thing about it, it's a great place to treat people for hepatitis C. And Alex Thompson, who runs the Victoria program, Andrew Lloyd in Sydney, is doing a, doing a great job with this type of stuff. Um, and hot off the press sort of stuff. We're actually being successful, but I'm going to go really, really fast because I had to distract myself. Hepatitis C vaccine would be great. We were all very excited. There was the phase two trial coming out and the trial came out and said it didn't work. But it's really important. And this is work again by our group, um, which hopefully will be accepted very soon, which clearly shows that there is a benefit to a vaccine. In some countries, particularly when there's poor harm reduction, you will need a vaccine, you won't be successful. So we do need investment in it. So elimination is feasible, treatment is now affordable, so why the limited progress? So another barrier, and this is work we did last year, was essentially going, so we've got all of this, we know how to do it, why aren't we actually being successful? And I was asked to chair the World Innovation Summit for Health um, Viral Hepatitis Forum last year. When we looked at it, we thought, well, what do we need to try and help globally for us to get this 
show on the road, not just in Australia, not just in a few countries, not just in those 12 countries, but elsewhere. So we basically said, let's work out how to sort out the investment case. Being done for HIV was successful. So we spent a lot of time last year working on this. And essentially, this is our investment framework. So we came up with an investment framework of what needed to be done, what's the financing, the activity and the return on investment. <coughs> and really, when we looked at activities, we looked at national activities and international activities and what the enablers were. And when we looked at the return on investment, we talked about direct economic benefits, indirect economic benefits and cross-sectorial to fit with the SDGs and how it's a non-siloed approach. We looked at the various countries that were implementing effective plans, which I mentioned to you. And we then divided them up into how would we think about these activities? Evidence gathering, who's doing a good job at that? Who's doing good jobs at implementation? And who's where the integrated systems? Because you will need to integrate it. There will be no global fund that comes in like happened with HIV. The Gates Foundation are not doing viral hepatitis, all sorts of things. Again, another story, another time. So we looked at what did Georgia do in terms of political commitment development? So we went through each different countries and different case studies, and this is just um, about to be published. This component of the paper, South Africa decided a development, a clear, developed a clear investment case for development to make it that the government could see the benefit of funding their elimination program. Because it does cost you real dollars initially. You have to pay some money initially. Scotland, really good at data. So we went through different countries I'm just going to, oh, Egypt. I'll just, we'll touch on Egypt just to say Egypt's got the highest prevalence in the world essentially because they had a treatment program for schistosomiasis using injections spread all through. So it's a generalised epidemic. D did brilliant things in terms of all sorts of treatment, setting up community, blah, blah, blah. And in the last year, um, their president decided, as one can in those kind of countries, that we're just going to, I think we're going to test. I remember when I was being told it because I do some work in Egypt. And uh, a colleague of mine who I've known for years, she said, oh, the president's decided we're going to test 60 million people this year and treat them. <laughs> yeah, 60, 60 million? Yeah, 60 million in a year? Yeah. And you go, you go yeah, right, that's going to be funny. And then I was doing a slide where I was trying to go, oh, where are you up to? I'm up to, you know, nothing but 4.8. <laughs> Two weeks later, 6.2. It's like, I couldn't keep my slide up. Yeah, normally it doesn't matter if you've got an extra 20 cases to add, you think I'll just leave them out. But like they're going up by tens of millions every week. And it's like, oh man. So they've got up to about 48 million people tested in a year. Now, sometimes Egypt doesn't always tell the truth. If you need to <laughs> <laughs> the president to feel happy. But the reality is, even if it's not 48 million, it'll be 30 million. Like it's massive what they're doing. So it's one of the most extraordinary medical things that's going on in Egypt at the moment, public health responses that you would ever want to see. So when they eventually, if they ever eventually write it up, it'll be fun. Australia, we're doing a good job. And the reason we're doing a good job, and I always like to do this, regardless of your politics, Susan Lamb made a really brave decision to make it universal treatment. And it has to be acknowledged, this is a Liberal government that made treatment available for everybody. I fell off my chair. Not exactly literally, but almost. Because even though I've been asking for it, and even though I've been going up and da 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 and you're talking me, I actually didn't expect them to do it. I thought they're going to go only stage three or four severe disease. And when they said, no, treatment for everybody, blah, 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 it's like, holy crap. Ruined two studies that I was doing, made that prime study really hard and the TAP study really hard because it became available for everybody. So ruined two beautiful studies of mine. I could have got a New England publication, I reckon, out of one of them. Still won't now. But one of the best decisions. So treatment for everybody. But really important other things. No restrictions on disease stage, so treatment for everybody. No restrictions on drug and alcohol use. Prescription specialists and other doctors and treatment available in prisons. Deliberately designed for this. So it means that we can make great inroads. But we're not getting there yet because we've had this fall off. It's called the warehousing and waterfall effect and all sorts of names, but it's our biggest issue. To raise awareness, to get testing happening, to make sure we maintain our numbers. It's our biggest challenge, but we are making headways. And as you can see, some work, we set up a surveillance system to do with um, bubble viruses. And this shows that we are having impact. For one of time, I won't give details, except it's going, it's happening, but we need to push on. There's a big EC partnership that I'm involved with, and I think anybody that's come through the Burnett has worked on it at some stage. The Ramsey Foundation gave us $11.3 million with our program grant and other work to actually work nationally to try and sort of catalyse testing for the next couple of years. So if you ever have an opportunity to tell somebody to get tested, to get doctors to get involved, get nurses to get involved, get community to get involved, get involved. Work by Greg Dorr, the Kirby Institute has shown we're reducing deaths as well. So a lot of people are doing a lot of work on this. So back to this investment framework. 
return on investment. So impact of elimination, if you do nothing, it just goes up. If you go half assed it's out here, eliminate, get rid of new infection, stop deaths. Sorry, that was stop deaths. Get rid of the mortality. And here's the thing. You do have to pay, and this costs you money, 51 billion. But at 2030, you've made, you've sorted out your costs. Okay, that's with direct costs. So 51 billion, but you've got to be prepared to pay that initial amount of money, and you begin to save money. Much cheaper than HIV in those, and the reality is because they're secure, you'll make it. Not that I'm against HIV in those, because I actually do HIV as well. Really important we do that, and malaria, and TB. But I'm just saying, for the because that was that's this is aimed at Gates and Global Fund that do HIV, malaria, TB. We want a little bit of their money, not all of their money. This is where, depending on how you think about it, where the costs are. And this is the important one. Getting back to the beginning of the talk, if we think about those indirect costs, because now I'm at work. Now, this is why Egypt decided to do it. They suddenly realised the epidemic was getting significant and people staying at home to look after sick partners, to look after sick parents, to look after sick children. You pay that money. As I said, you stop paying it at 2030. You recovered, yeah, you know, costs are even. You actually begin to make money through indirect costs because of your, basically, your, um, your finance systems. The people are at work, people are not sick. So indirect costs, when you take into account indirect costs, it becomes highly cost effective. We gave ideas, sorry, about how to integrate the systems, because this is quite a complex thing to do, depending on your country. But it's doable. So the, the WISH report has had a, a significant impact globally, because it's essentially saying to countries, this is doable. We've designed the model now so that each country where it's about to be released can do their own using the same report, putting their country targets to say, well, what do we need to do and how do you optimise it? Because it's different for different countries. And even within Australia, different regions where we have areas where we don't have the same things going on. So it's possible. Considerable amount of work needs to be happening. It's being done, but we need more work being done. We need investment. For me, if I was to say, despite all of this evidence, and this is invariably what happens with many diseases and with many people and with many populations. Now, if you think about Aboriginal health and why that's not doing well, it's stigma and discrimination, intergenerational trauma, the kind of things, how we impact on people. If you think about people who inject drugs, if you think about many, many populations that we're working with, it's stigma and discrimination despite evidence. And that's partly our training. It's partly our medical training is partly how many of the people who get to be positions of power get brought up. It's an instinct. Think about refugees and what's happening with refugees. The reason we will fail in HIV, probably to eliminate HIV globally, is because countries will have programs to treat their citizens, but not their refugees or not their migrants, because we other. Stigma and discrimination, I think, is one of the biggest things in public health, that othering of other people which makes it that we don't make wise decisions about how we provide health services, prevention services, and allocate funding, I think will be our biggest barricade. Lots of people to acknowledge. Thank you.